Okay, hi there and welcome to a labour market video looking at the interaction between a monopsony employer and trade unions. So what is monopsony? Well, it's a situation where there's an employer-led buying power in the labour market. In the sense, this firm has significant power in the market when buying or hiring workers. And this monopsony power may lead to the employer paying lower wages lower pay than if the labour market was more competitive. Now in theory uh, we can show that a single firm monopsony, a profit maximising employer may choose to, to offer a wage in equilibrium which is lower than the value of the marginal revenue product of those people employed. If you're paying a, a, a worker less than the value they create that can lead to worker exploitation and the risk of an increase in working poverty which is highly topical at the moment. Working poverty is when a family with at least one person in paid work in a job uh, is stuck below the official relative poverty line which is usually 60% of median income. Let's work through quickly the monopsony analysis diagram. We're going to assume here that this is a profit maximizing employer with a downward sloping labor demand curve of the marginal revenue product of labor. The average cost of labor goes up, they have to bid the wage up to get extra workers and if the average cost is rising, then the marginal cost of labour will be increasing at a faster rate, assuming you have to pay all workers any increment to the wage. So the profit maximising employment level is where the marginal cost of labour intersects with marginal revenue product of labour, which is employment level E2. And at that employment level, the value of marginal revenue product created by the workers in this job, in this sector, is W2. However, the monopsony power of the employer allows them to pay a wage W3. They only have to use the labour supply curve, the average cost of labour, to determine the wage they have to pay. So in that sense, there is an underpayment by the employer. The wage they're paying, W3, is quite far below the marginal revenue product of labour, which is W2. So therefore, the monopsony, in theory, the monopsony employer can use their buying power, their market power, to pay a wage lower than the value of marginal revenue product. And in that sense, there's an exploitation of workers. Now we'll come on to unions. Trade unions are organisations that operate and act collectively on behalf of their members for improved pay and also better working conditions. And the phrase we use is that they, they operate with collective bargaining power in negotiations with businesses, employers, perhaps to improve pay, perhaps to protect pension rights or to address issues to do with unfair dismissal, certainly to try to improve working conditions, including health and safety at work, and also lobbying government, lobbying organisations for improvements to minimum wages and training. In the UK, there's been quite a significant fall in trade union membership. These are the latest official data available. Just over 6 million people in the UK in work are members of a union. That's well below half the level in 1979, when there were 13 million trade union members. Indeed, if you look at the percentage of people in work who are members of a union, that is now down below 25%. It's 23% compared to a third in 1995 and over 50% in 1979. And many more workers are unions in the public sector, for example in the NHS. Indeed in the private sector of the economy, there are only 13.5% of employees are members of union, whereas in the public sector it's just under 52%. So lots of stories in the news if you want to follow this kind of issue about uh, if you like uh, disputes and battles between unions and employers. Here's a good example from recently. The Amazon Air Pilots, uh, the pilots who uh, operate Amazon's fleet of aircraft. They are in dispute with Amazon over wages. Uh, Amazon's become a retail powerhouse. Some of the pilots who transport those packages are speaking out against what they describe as low wages, shoddy maintenance and stalled contract negotiations. This is a classic trade union monopsony dispute. Here's an example from the UK up in Cumbria. 
Sellafield, the nuclear power plant, there's a dispute between the uh, business which uh, operates the security at Sellafield and security guards who uh, are members of the Unite Union, a general purpose union. So there are two examples of unions battling, negotiating uh, with monopsonistic employers. So how might a trade union with significant bargaining power, let's say a union that has the threat, the credible threat of strike action, a union which has negotiating clout and influence, how might a union with bargaining power impact on a monopsony employer? Let's go back to our diagram. This is the kind of analysis diagram you can draw to get great marks. Current wage is W3 and E2 people are employed. Don't forget, the profit maximizing monopsonist will employ up to E2, but they only have to pay W3 because that's the average cost of labor curve, the labor supply curve. Well, the union could use their collective bargaining power to negotiate a pay rise. Let's say they negotiate, if you like, a pay floor, a minimum pay rate, similar, if you like, to a minimum wage, but a union negotiated pay of, let's say, W4, a trade union negotiated wage rate. Now, at W4, that effectively becomes the going rate. In other words, the employer will have to pay that wage if they want to attract extra workers. That becomes effectively the marginal cost of employing extra workers. I've set it deliberately so that it intersects with the labour supply curve and the labour demand curve intersects with the new wage rate at employment level E4. So in which case, if the unions negotiate a higher wage, that then becomes the marginal cost of labour up to the intersection point and therefore the profit maximising employment level rises to E4. So in this sense, in this monopsony example, the trade union may achieve both higher pay and higher employment. So in this situation, a trade union using their bargaining power, they've got control over the supply of labour, uh, battling with a monopsonist who has buying power on the demand side of the labour market, they may end up at an equilibrium where pay and employment are both higher than they were before. This goes against the conventional wisdom, if you like, that pay rises lead to job losses. A trade union may be able to negotiate higher pay and higher employment. While it's crucial, of course, to evaluate the extent to which this is all likely to happen. Here are three ideas for evaluating monopsony power in trade unions. The first point is one of my favourite evaluation approaches in theory but in practice. So as we've seen, in theory, a monopsony may pay lower wages, but in practice they don't have to. Indeed, many firms, even if they have big buying power in their local economy, they don't necessarily pay that low monopsony wage. I think a really good example, actually, of the deep discount supermarkets such as Lidl and Aldi. Aldi, for example, has just increased their minimum pay for basic, uh, basic employees. And their rate is 10p higher, actually, than the living wages recommended with a living wage of, of £9 per hour outside London. And they're paying £10.55 per hour for Aldi workers in London. So Aldi are a supermarket which pays above, if you like, the going rate for supermarket workers. Even though fast-growing business, major employer, they have some monopsony power. Linked with that is my second evaluation point, which is about challenging assumptions. The theory so far has assumed that productivity remains unchanged, unaffected by wages. We have something called the efficiency, the efficiency wage theory, which I'll take you through in a second, which says that increasing wages, paying better wages per hour, can actually lead to increased productivity. And therefore, if firms increase the wage, some or all of the higher wage costs will be will be recouped, will be gathered back through, for example, better staff retention, fewer people leave, and perhaps higher labour productivity. My third evaluation point is to see the bigger picture. These big firms, Deliveroo, Uber, Amazon, those kind of big superstar firms, are they getting too big? So is there a case for intervention in the market? Not necessarily via trade unions, but, for example, a more rigorous competition policy or perhaps a more generous legal minimum wage. A thought to ponder. 
let me just take you through the efficiency wage theory because it gives you a chance to develop your diagram on the monopsony side. So the efficiency wage theory is the idea that paying more, paying people better, can actually lead to increased productivity. So initially our wage, let's say, is at W4, union negotiated wage. If people become more productive, that's going to lead to an outward shift of the labour demand curve, the marginal revenue product of labour curve. Here it is. Uh, the LD curve shifts to LD2 and the equilibrium wage, assuming they're not going to pay a monopsony wage, the equilibrium now moves to W5. Higher wages and employment caused by increased productivity. So in other words, there are situations where trade unions may agree with uh, an option employer a wage productivity agreement they link pay rises per year to improved productivity they might target for example a two percent increase in productivity and say right if that happens wages can go up by three percent or they might target some sort of measure of of growth of sales per worker if unions and uh, employers can negotiate favorable pay and productivity agreements there might be some mutual gains both for the business and its shareholders as well as the unions and the people they represent. We would call this a mutual gain from trade and it's a good example of cooperative game theory. Okay, so some technical detail there, but some examples hopefully that might be useful when we consider trade unions operating in a market with a monopsony.